Good day, Robert. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me today over Zoom. Well, Guy, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure for me. It's a pleasure to be doing it over Zoom. The only way to make it more pleasurable it would be if it was in the morning because I'm a morning guy. <laughs> me too. Maybe we should uh, arrange it that way. But anyway, so I want, uh, so my purpose for this particular video is to talk about the overlap and gaps between HPT, Human Performance Technology, and TQM, Total Quality Management. And okay. there, before we get into all of that, I just wanted to uh, be able to talk a little bit about this. You've, you've existed uh, as a consultant in both camps, doing uh, instruction, training, learning kinds of things. You've also bridge the gap over into what I would call the quality world and doing uh, improvement efforts under that banner, if you will. And so part of my goal here is to help people begin to understand, you know, what's what's the same or different about all of this? And uh, how would we collaborate together if we were uh, working with people coming at uh, improvement from a quality lens or from a from an instructional design lens in particular. But but before we go into that, so I'd like you to introduce yourself, give us your name and tell us where did you grow up? <laughs> so my name is Robert D'Amelio. Um, there's still some debate as to whether I've actually grown up. When people get to know me, they say, when are you gonna grow up? And I go, well, if you mean by lose the childlike quality of naive innocence, never. So I grew up, uh, geographically speaking, in three or four different states. Uh, my parents moved around. My dad was a uh, something called a technical support contractor for the Air Force. So wherever the Air Force went, in the uh, wherever certain planes in the Air Force went, this is pre-Vietnam War era. So he was uh, associated. He worked for a company called the Public Aviation Corporation. No longer exists, but one of their big claims to fame was stuff that went on something called the F-104 or the F-105. Those were big bad boys uh, back in the 50s and 60s. Well, 60s. Mm -hmm. So tell me... Well, the Air Force Base, for example, was where the depot, where's the depot, where those things were. So, you know, I <laughs> was uprooted from Mobile, Alabama <laughs> at the age of about six to Las Vegas, Nevada from... Uh, actually, I lived there from... Um, I guess it was between, so it would have been seven or eight, I guess, from eight to 13. Then we came to back to Jacksonville, Florida, went to high school, college at Florida State. After Florida State, which is Tallahassee, by the way, not Gainesville. Don't ever make that mistake, anyone. The, uh, then I was hired in by Texas Instruments in the great state of Texas in 1979, which I lived until 2013 officially moved back to Jacksonville, Florida, in connection with some uh, parental responsibilities. My mom had dementia. So enough we're, going, we're not going to talk anymore about that. But I had to deal with that. I was the only living relative. Now I'm just the only living. I'm the last of my car. So. Uh -huh. Well, thank you for that. Now, you and I met when you were working with uh, Northern Telecom back in 1993. Yes. And uh, my firm had a a contract with your organization and that's where we met but tell us a little bit about after you left college what was your career progression what kinds of jobs did you have to and bring us all the way up to today okay wow so um <laughs> to hear my mom uh talk about it um the time period of my career where i had real jobs was uh between 1979 and 1988. So those jobs were at Texas Instruments. I had two real jobs at Texas Instruments. One was the defense contract administrator in the Defense Systems Electronics Group. They hired me as a new hire right out with Florida State with my brand new MBA in finance. So that was that. I didn't know what a contract administrator was, didn't know what a government contract was. I did know about Texas Instruments but that's because of the calculators, not the uh, top secret government equipment that they made, which is where I ended up working. I saw people with calculators. Now, the second job at Texas Instruments 
um, was triggered by I me mean, basically being benched, waiting 18 months for a top secret clearance to come through, which is how long it took to get them way back then. That's something called the Office of Personnel Management. You might have had a game with them on an occasion. Um, they would go off and interview, and they had big backlogs of work um, to try to make sure that, you know, um, bad people didn't end up getting uh, top secret uh, clearance to, uh, you know, things like stealth technology nowadays. Anyway, um, so that was the second job at TI. Uh, I left TI and went to Northern Telecom, which is where we met. Um, Northern Telecom, and just, okay, so my second job, I'm sorry, at TI, I was something called a management development instructor. So I've gone from contract administrator, no training in that, until I got, it was all on the job training, which is important. That shaped a lot of my thinking later on. We can talk about that. The second thing, management development instructor, Wow, no training for that. How in the world did I get picked for that? That's an interesting thing, too. We could talk about that if you want. Um, and th that came about because of, you know, the delay and the top secret clearance. But the management development instructor thing was fascinating to me because it was just, you know, uh, TI, one of the things that they had, being a giant company at the time, you could do internal transfers from one business unit to another. So the first business unit, and they had six at the time, one business, one of which made calculators. Anyway, but the business units, I, I was in two of the six, never the one that made calculators. So the defense systems electronics group, I was in that one. Something called Geophysical Services International, I was in that one. Defense, DSIG, Defense System Electronics Group, is now part of Raytheon. GSI, Geophysical Services Inc., which was the people that collected seismic data so the oil companies could try to avoid dry holes, which, you know, we know things about when, of the ARCO work we did. That's important to people like that when you're talking really, really expensive holes in the ground. Um, so that was the second business unit, GSI. They're now pal uh, they are now a part of Halliburton. Okay, so I went to Northern Telecom, management development instructor, the reason I get this is a this is a, this is a, hmm. so the reason not many people know this the reason I went to Northern Telecom from TI management development instructor was that I <laughs> it's gonna sound immodest I was too good at my my role uh, a management development instructor I actually wanted to help the leaders of the business so I went and talked to them personally these are VPs and and I mean. Leaders, leaders of the business, not, not when I say leaders of the business, not like you're reading a book. These are, you know, like the number two, number three people in that business unit. I actually, you know, did meet the president, but uh, he wasn't really in the mood for any kind of training stuff. But the, or any kind of stuff for that matter, uh, unless it was stuff that, uh, you know, could help him avoid dry holes for oil companies. It was really interesting. There. Anyway, so I went and I had um, I was I had been given the dubious honor of uh, facilitating what was the worst they used for learning and development professionals. A lot of people are familiar with this, and I think the Kirkpatrick four level evaluation model. So the first two levels is where Texas Instruments lived. Just the first two, really the first. One. Which, you know, which is, if I recall correctly, is end of course attitude uh, or perception reactions, something like that, right? A little Likert scale on one to five, maybe sometimes degree, strong, you know, stuff like that. How did you feel about the learning? Okay. So uh, I, was in a room, <laughs> I was in a room with all these, like VP and his direct reports and all this stuff from a major. The GSI was uh, divided into land and marine. So that meant looking for oil on land, looking for oil in the sea. That's what those two things meant. Um, so I'm in there, and I had been given the responsibility to train first-line supervisors in either of those organizations. These are people that worked in the field. They never came in the office. All of the existing management development training, and I use that word loosely, but I 
hopefully I won't offend any of your audience. It was all custom, not custom. It was all um, off the shelf, what Joe Harness would call soft skills training. Soft skills training. Very important things like, uh, and I mean this, so, so, you know, he had to do performance appraisals. He had to do um, EEOC. It's all the stuff that was required by law. No manager, no leader wanted to do it. They had to do it. No, nobody wanted to go through it. Anyway, so the, the, and given that backdrop, the learning for that was what we would now call death by PowerPoint. It was horrendous. I, I was in charge. I inherited something. I watched. I sat through it just like a learner would. And I said, gee, this is really bad. And then I said, you know, wow, let's look at the ratings. And it was the worst rated course of any curriculum, any in the entire management development curriculum. That's what they gave the new hired guy. So I said, I see what's going on here. So I said, let's see what we can do. So I went and I met with each of the, uh, it, was, it involved about 20 different people because they'd each come in with their own deck of slides and they didn't know what to do. They, so they showed them all and there was no interactivity. And this took place over a two, two to three week period, guy. So it's not enough. I mean, you, you know, now this would be against the law, I think, for like torture reasons. But back then it was okay. So uh, I, I talked to a couple of people. I went. I, I went up. I went up to to uh, the VP of the Marine Organization, who happened to know me. He said, "I remember you from. Um, you worked for for Max. You're his uh, assistant." I said, "Yeah, I'm. Yeah." He said. Well, what do you want? And I said, I was just curious. Has anyone, I said, I'd kind of like to go out on one of your boats and see how that work actually takes place. And he said, you, what? I said, I'd like to, you know, has anybody ever done it? He said, no. He said, hold on. Gets on the phone while I'm standing there. Next thing you know, he's made arrangements for me to go to Lyric, Scotland to get on the boat. I, I hadn't talked to my boss or his boss, anything like that. He said, I'll talk to your your management chain. You need to show up at the airport. There'll be a ticket waiting, blah, blah, blah. I went, okay. Well, my boss wasn't happy about that. But his boss, the director, was incensed about that. That's why I ended up leaving Texas Instruments because uh, I'll fast forward to the end of how all this stuff worked. I went in the lean world, they call this go to Gimba, but I called it job analysis. <laughs> As a learning professional, it, it, it's job and task analysis. So I went and said, what does the job of a field supervisor who collects seismic data on an ocean going vessel include? What does it consist of? What are the major accomplishments? What's involved with that? What's the environment they work in? Holy cow. So I came armed with all that information. I had that and said, you know, I've never seen such a mismatch between what the job requires and what is currently being offered. So I changed completely what was being offered so that it, what? It kind of lined up with what they needed on the job. And then radical troublemaker that I was, I said, you know what? I think we can get to those other two levels on the Kirkpatrick model. Do they learn skills that they transfer? And is there business value to those skills? So I built in some evaluation stuff. Um, and the answer is yes, it transferred. They sent me the people from the field. Uh, they had telexes back then. There was no such thing as email. But they said, ooh, I used what I learned in the negotiation session to save X hundreds of dollars on what I have, would have had to pay for, for, I don't know, it was tires or whatever stuff, they supplies they needed in the field when they came to the shore. No one in the history of management development had ever done that. That was very threatening. It turned out to the director, whose job he felt was to maintain the, how did he put it? He actually said status quo. No, no, he said, maintain the culture 
of the organization, maintaining the culture of the organization. I was a threat to the culture of the organization. I really was. Um, that, that same uh, VP said, I want you to come work for me. I want to promote you. Um, because what I've learned from my experience from you is that down in the training department, they teach what they know, not what we need. Wow. So when I, <laughs> I didn't mean to cause this kind of trouble. It was very troublesome. I got slapped hard for it, professionally speaking. I did not take that sitting down. That's how you met me at Northern Telecom. How about that first story? That's a, well, thank you for that. Yeah. So what's, what's interesting, you, you referred to it as a Gemba walk, but I don't think you were talking that language back then. No, they weren't. We knew it as, you know, go out to the job, observe the people performing the jobs, interview yep. people performing the jobs, review yep. documents associated with people doing the job. Yep. And, and later on in your career, you kind of shifted uh, my, in the way I saw it from a person doing instructional design work who wants to focus on performance and sees other issues that knowledge and skills won't address, and they shift over to do performance improvement. And when you shifted later on in your career, you kind of embraced some of the more popular, well-known quality improvement initiative types of things like lean. And but but I'll let you talk about that a little bit later on. But so you had this terrible experience in that you tried to do the right thing. You did a good thing and you got punished for it. <laughs> yeah, I really did. And then the other guy said, you know, come and work for me. So where where did you go from well I, I didn't I didn't um well he said I'm gonna I'm gonna call the director. Um and tell him I want you to come work for me. Well, the, the, well, the director did not take that call well. Mm -hmm. He said to me, he called me in his office. He said, "Well, naturally, I blocked that promotion." Those, that's the first thing he said. He said, "Those guys, those guys, meaning the Marine Division." He said they have a long history of being troublemakers. You don't want to be a part of that. So I blocked the promotion for you. You'll thank me later. And I went, "Yeah, I don't think so." I didn't thank him for it, guy. Um, I thought that was whether it would whether it whether there was any truth to the perception that these guys are troublemakers. I would never know. I would have made that judgment myself. I always do in every situation with every client because you can't you can't go in and if you go if you allow yourself to be to be how do I say this your perceptions and expectations to be shaped for you. How good are you as an analyst? How good are you as an observer? How good are you as a person that can see things uh, that other people just don't see? I think your, the answer is not very good if, if you're there to be a pair of hands for somebody that has a predetermined solution. So that was that. So that's why I got, remember I was a management development instructor too. That was weird. So so what I ended up doing, I didn't realize this at the time, because I redesigned all that learning from the ground up. How did I do that? I had no training. I had no background. But there was something called the Mager Six Pack. It was just sitting in a cube across from me. Then it caught my eye one day. I went, what the heck is that? I went over there. I had never seen such a thing before. And it was in the training department, which is even more ironic because clearly they had never seen such a thing before because they use all um, off the shelf materials made from very uh, household name companies you would recognize now. I'm mm -hmm. still in business. Um, and there's a market for that. It's, you know, it's, it's what I would call necessary, but not sufficient. Okay. So uh, the, the best of it is necessary, but not sufficient. The worst of it is just, a waste of money. Now, okay, so um, we went, I went to Northern Telecom. That was a pure, straight up technical training function. Why? How did I have that connection? There were several people that were unhappy, it turns out, with uh, training and instruction. 
throughout different parts of Texas Instruments. I did not know that. Um, but it, so I get a call from someone who had who, who had used to work uh, inside GSI as an instructor. I, actually, as an instructor someplace. And he said, well, I heard you ran into some issues. And I went, who are you and why are you calling? And he said, well, I used to work so-and-so and so and i knew so-and-so and they they heard about the stuff that you went through. And so I'm here to tell you that I work for a company called Norman Telecom. We got lots of openings. You really should come over here because um, I think you'll fit in pretty well. And I went, oh, well, maybe I'll look into it. So I got hired by uh, a very forward-thinking white person named Diane Collins. you remember her? Do you ever meet her? I don't think so. He was the director of training when you were there. Um, not she didn't up. She start, she was the director when I was there. <laughs> she hired me as a course developer, but I never developed a single course for Northern Telecom. Why? That's a different story. We don't we don't have time by going to that, but the long story short is she wanted me to re-engineer the learning process, meaning they had a three-week course that was leader-led, that was bottleneck for the number one selling product um, that Northern Telecom sold at the time. Huge cash cow. Customers loved it. Couldn't get enough of it. But it really required training in order to program. It's called a digital switch. This was when all switches made by AT&T were called analog switches. The difference in technology. And it's huge. This is the beginning of the digital age, Scott, is how old um, <clears throat> I am. I can spell digital. Okay. Now, I know it has something to do with ones and zeros. Okay. But so she wanted me to do, do this and do this newfangled thing called computer-based training. I knew nothing about that at the time. Um, but she said, what I want you to do is head up a project that will convert well, or create an alternative to the leader-led project that will help customers achieve the same level of performance mastery using the same end of course mastery test. And it really was a mastery test. It was a test you had to program the switch and do all, it really was. It was a great example of level three, uh, of uh, Kirkpatrick's level three. Now the fourth uh, example of that would be, and what does that do for their Companies, customers. Oh my God. Anyway, so the, so we called this thing, we, Northern Telecom, the, the leadership of the training function, and a gentleman by the name of Rich Boucher, who is an absolutely wonderful instructional designer, nicest person in the world. He's the one that introduced me to ISPI and Joe Harness in particular. He said, You haven't developed any courses. I said, Nope. He said, Man, you got, you're going to have to. You're going to have to get up speed fast. I said, well, how do I do that? ISPR, Joe Harden. He's got some stuff. Start there. Well, I did. Or he was right. I got up speed fast. And then Eminem met a few other people, some of which you're very familiar with in ISPR. Um, and I got up to speed even faster. I got what, to really what heartless uh, things did you uh, use to uh, you know, get up to speed? Okay, so JAWS, Job Aids Workshop, that was a big yep. technology. Job Aids, I continue to use Job Aids 40 years or more later. Job Aids are wonderful. When you when the environment calls for Job Aids, you use Job Aids because you can store, <laughs> how about this? You can store information in people's heads or you can store it on paper. Now you can store it on computer. That was something Joe used to say all the time. Job Aids, store it on paper. When the environment calls for it, what does that mean? The work environment that you're working in, the, the uh, criticality of the tasks, the, the incentives and consequences in place, you know, some things like that. You learn all that stuff. You also learn something called front-end analysis for soft skills training. Feast. That. Joe liked acronyms. He said, whatever you do later in life, make sure it has a good acronym. I said, thank you, Joe. That's, I can remember that. I can't I remember much, but I remember that. So I went to Feast, Jaws, and then he actually came up with something called ABCD, accomplishment-based curriculum development. Wow. That 
was unlike anything that most people will ever experience in their lifetimes. I can say that with absolute certainty. I believe. <laughs> anyway, so though I went through all of that. I went through meaning uh, everything that Joe did, he created was to say the very least learner centered. Really, it was as close to self-paced training as I've ever experienced before or since. The only other person that had anything close, similar to that would have been Robert Maker and his criterion reference instruction, done well. A lot of people don't get those, like they hear the word, they think the something, but they don't have to do it. All right, so that's what. Now, then the other way that I really, really, really got up to speed really fast on instructional systems design stuff, guy, is through the work of Dr. Ruth Clark. Dr. Ruth Clark, or as I call her now, Dr. Ruth Clark. Um, I learned something called the content performance matrix from her. It was based on the work of Dr. David Merrill. She was a student of David Merrill's. Wow, that was the most time efficient and performance effective model for instructional systems design process I've ever seen because it, it looks at content, five different kinds, at remember and apply levels. Very simple, very straightforward for a guy like me to do. And I could use that and explain that model. And I was able to leverage it with my company that I started, all of which had <laughs> masters and PhDs in structural systems design. And they said, what are you doing talking to us about job aids and later process mapping from Gary Rumbert and the content performance matrix. We got PhDs from places like Florida State where Roger Kaufman walked the halls. So you can't be telling us stuff like this. I said, yeah, here's the thing. When I do stuff for clients, I want it to have the same look and feel. That was before things like customer experience became a, a thing. I just called it look and, look and feel. I also wanted to be equally effective. I wanted everybody to have common mental models and how they approach the work. And that's what I did using all those people. So I did, I taught everybody JAWS inside my own company, the job based workshop. Uh, Many of them um, weren't, weren't really excited about Feast because they really were in their heart of hearts and structural designers. So when you do front-end analysis, soft skills training, there's training and non-training things, They what they heard was training. And what they brought was, yeah, we went to school for this. We're good at this. Even though he keeps trying to get us to use this content performance matrix thing, we think we know some stuff. So I said, hey, um, show me the design document that you prepared. Show me the analysis. I'll take a look at it, and we'll go from there. We ended up with a content performance matrix stuff, but I, I wanted them to feel I didn't want to miss out on anything. If they had something, seriously, if they had something that in my simple little feeble mind was as good as or better, I would have adopted it, but I never encountered it. Now, in all fairness, a couple of them I hired for their expertise in computer-based training, and we never got there. We, ne we never got there. Meaning, um, my 800-pound gorilla client at the time, which was Lockheed Martin, we were staffing up. I required, literally recruited people from all over the United States, relocating them, all this stuff. Paid them a lot more than people thought I did, a lot more than I paid myself at the time. A lot more. <laughs> um, which people never believe, but it's true. Um, Dick Cheney, as part of the uh, Bush, one of the Bush administrations, uh, canceled a major defense program that I just happened to be the prime supplier on to Lockheed. So that wiped out 90% of my business in one afternoon and one phone call. So that was a, a setback. All right. So th that was bad for your company when uh, Dick Cheney uh, ended that uh, huge uh, defense project and uh, so where did you go from there well then i learned something um i learned what a business model is for the first time um and that i needed a different one so my business model at the time was very labor intensive i did custom performance um training materials for fortune 500 clients particularly in the aerospace and defense industries but not exclusively so i i, I had a a very, uh, uh, you know, pretty good 
um, 14, all five 14, 14, 500 client lists. So I had people like Frito-Lay. It had people like um, Snyder Electric or Square D Company, um, Dow Corning, Dow Chemical. Um, it, 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 it's hard to remember these things back then because this was, you know, when I was younger. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know. so did you continue on with your company? And what I'm interested in getting to is yeah. when you first began to make the uh, yeah. Because uh, yeah. I, I always consider that you left instructional systems design and that wing of performance improvement, if you will, the Harless, Mager, uh, Rumler kinds of approaches to looking at performance improvement beyond instruction. But but you made that that transition into the world of TQM. It, it, from my perspective, that's how I look at it uh, decades ago when, when I thought you were making that change. Tell me a little bit about that change and, and when you got interested in what's known as lean and, and some of the other uh, quality improvement. Uh, yeah, so one of the one of the interesting things and positive things that actually happened at Texas Instruments before I went to Northern Telecom even was that there was a gentleman next to me on the other side, another professional. His job was to, this was in the late, Between 79 and 83, it would have been. So somewhere around that time frame. Um, that business unit, GSI in particular, yeah, so 81, 83, uh, had not introduced, and much of TI had not, believe it or not, introduced any of, you know, the quality stuff. So none of the work of Duran, None of the work of uh, Phil Cos Crosby or, um, oh gosh, what was the third one? Well, there's actually a couple more. But um, so I got, here's what got me interested in that. There was, there was, <laughs> he was watching, Joseph Duran had these videotape workbook things. And he was playing, uh, uh, so his job was trying to decide which, among the off-the-shelf providers for quality stuff, would they introduce into GSI? Well, you already know how I feel about off-the-shelf stuff, and I thought, gosh, you're going to do it with quality too? Because, wow, there's nothing been... <laughs> so, so if you're gonna if you're going to mess up a company, hey, here's two good ways to do it. One, um, use off-the-shelf stuff to train the leaders. At all levels of company, make sure you do that. Second, when you're thinking about quality, make sure you use off the shelf stuff for that too, because God forbid you look at it in the context of what your organization does and what its current state of quality is. Heck, at the time, guy, there was no definition of quality in existence in writing. So how do you know a good one when you see it? We would say, those of us that <clears throat> were exposed to Joe Harless, how do you know a good one when you see it? I thought that was important when it came to quality. So so one of the things that really jumped out to me was, hey, this quality stuff looks like it's got a future. Maybe not here, but I'll bet you it's going to be important later on. So that came with that, that little seed, that knowledge came with me. So I actually started investigating quality stuff while I was at Northern Telecom. Mm -hmm. uh, as I got, in, in fact, I actually put my, uh, I'm a big believer in professional development. So even when companies don't do it, I do it. I kept doing it. I still keep doing it. Um, but, you know, companies would sometimes send you to a, a workshop or some training. So I went to quality stuff and I went to ISPI stuff because the thing I liked about quality stuff Man, you didn't have to worry about the Kirkpatrick level four stuff. It was all level four stuff. <laughs> it was a defect and a cost of a cost of quality. It was nothing but dollarized um, um, uh, work products, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. so I thought, wow. So these people do this. They're, this is how they learn to see things. 
that's so different from people that come up in the training function. Um, not to say one's different than the other. Uh, uh, well, they are different. Or not to say one's better than the other. I always thought, well, you can't have one without the other. You need them both. Quality people need training people. Training people need quality people. Those guys really need to work together because it's all one work process. Mm -hmm. And that's the world I lived in is the one work process. When I had my little company, one of the first things I did when I, that I discovered also back in 1988, I started my company in 1988. I had, uh, Gary Rumler wrote an article, came out, I think it was in 1988, called The Three Levels of Quality. Oh my gosh. So I got really, you know, I said, wait a minute, quality. So he thinks, here's a guy who thinks this quality stuff's important too. I think it's important. I'm going to read that article, see what's in it. Oh, my gosh. That one article really changed the trajectory of my career. I mean, really. Then I found out, gosh, in addition to Joe Harless and some other luminaries in ISPI, there was a gentleman by the name of Gary Rumley, the same one that co-authored that article with Alan Brace. Now, Alan Brace, I never saw at ISPI. But I did see him meet him a couple of times because he lived in Irving, Texas, and I lived in Irving, Texas for a long time. Anyway, but Gary, I hired Gary to come. <laughs> Remember, I said I taught all of the PhDs and everything, Jaws. I had Gary himself come and teach my whole organization something called organization mapping, is what he mm -hmm. called it, the course he had back then. And they all said to me, my, my, well, first, Gary said, you know, most come, I, this is unusual. I've never, I've never really been hired to come do this for a company your size. So I took that as a compliment. I'm not sure I was intended, but, you know, knowing Gary, it was, it was an actual observation. <laughs> you know, and when he, when he said that, he, he really meant exactly what he said, which is, you know, I've never, never been hired for a company my size to do that stuff. And, um, uh, I doubt anybody my size has done it since. But, um, boy, I like that stuff. I took to that stuff like a fish in water. I mean, that, that, that stuff, it's, it's to me, it tapped into so many things. I, I, first off, you know, I'd already gone through a hardest front end analysis for soft skill training. So I like the front end analysis stuff. Well, Gary had a whole different way of, of uh, different yet similar way of looking at that that he got from Tom Gilbert, of course. Tom Gilbert. Well, uh, I actually think that Rumler probably had it before Gilbert because Rumler was, you know, a, a, a degreed engineer from University of Michigan and got his MBA and then joined with George Geis. Praxis. George Ordearn. Yeah. yeah. Praxis came later. Oh, okay. Spent about right. a decade at the University of Michigan running – uh, a series of workshops with Dale Breathauer and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 come yeah, in and all that. Yeah, yeah but okay. uh, so yeah. he kind of brought in that process orientation. I remember him one time he told me that uh, you know Gilbert was, and I don't know how true if ever, people could argue about this, but Gilbert was all about individual performance. In yeah, the behavioral engineering model. Yeah, 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 behavioral engineering model. And, and, and Gary has a version of that in his improving performance, managing the white space in the organization chart book. He's got mm -hmm. a version of that. He didn't call it the behavioral engineering model. He has something called the human performance system, um, which is a version, a version of the behavioral engineering model. In my, in my, it's a simplified version because. Yeah. And that I, from he, he invented that. With Dale Brethauer when they were at the University of Michigan, cool. I because okay. they both had they both had different labels for the same thing, and I asked him one time. I said, "Why do you call it this thing?" And, and Dale Brethauer calls it this other thing, and he goes, "Well, you know, we were we both kind of co-invented it." And I said, "Well, oh, so that he made some comment about well, Dale was holding the pen at the flip chart easel when we created it." That you know, that problem is exactly the way it was. Um, guy knowing going knowing Gary, I never had it had the privilege to meet Dale Brethauer, but I, I knew of him through Gary's work mm -hmm. um, and through Kimberly. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, uh, 
but yeah. but all right. So so you got exposed to the Rummers' approach to all of this. This was after your exposure to the quality approaches of this, and which was also after your Harless experience. So you kind of went from yep. HPT kind of an approach to TM yep. back to more HPT. Yep. Yep, and I've never let go of the HPT. I don't call it HPT. People choke on that, on those words. It's very, uh, uh, it, it, it hurts people's heads when you try to use the word human performance technology. Those are three abstract concepts that never should be used in the same sentence. Um, but people insist on it, particularly in, in ISPI. And so, you know, you can't really, you, you, you know, you, uh, Every time I, I, uh, I any any time I tried to broach that terminology with any of my clients, you could just see their eyes glaze over. And so, so, I, so I, I heard something very recently by a guy named Seth Godin. He 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 does marketing stuff. He's, he's a guru in marketing stuff. Anyway, he says people don't um, buy what you make or provide. They buy how it makes them feel. Okay. The experience. Now, if you're yeah. talking human performance technology and you're talking that, that term and everything that involves, that's the product. That is not how it makes them feel. And so once I, once I flipped that switch in my own head, I went... I gotta stop. I can't. I can't talk. I gotta use the way a client would experience the, the results of having this mysterious magical thing applied without talking about the mysterious magical thing, because it, um, they'll latch on to the, the the. There's no such thing as magic. Therefore, you must be a charlatan. Okay, so we don't want to talk about that stuff. Um, so let's talk about what problems your organization uh, is facing. What, what's it costing you? What, do you? what kind of complaints are you getting? What's your quality level? What are the defects? What are the uh, opportunities? What, what would happen if you, to your profit margin if you could lower your costs by eliminating defects? That language they understood, especially in the quality function. That's why I like the quality function, because they automatically dollarize business results. They can't help it. It's how they are, it's the middle models they use. They call them defects or defective or, you know, doesn't meet requirements. And requirements means very specific things in the world of quality. Um, uh, then it would say uh, to an IT professional requirements, there is a little bit different. They're both uh, equally, in fact, they're almost one and the same, but they manifest themselves differently in those different disciplines. And so a good human performance technologist would see that and would know what to do with it, wouldn't they, guy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah the whole the, the, uh, the, the moment here on the language, the whole human performance technology. Yep, yep. You know the the it used to be performance technology when yep. technology meant the application of science. Right, exactly. At the same time, it was the same president of ISPI and SPI back in those days that, yep. that decided that Tom Gilbert would be the father of human performance technology and yep. call it human performance technology. And I think that they were doing that because of his book, Human sure. Evidence. And yeah. Uh, you know, so this this has been an issue for that society for a long I, time. I, they can't I get come that. to an agreement on what what to yeah. call it, their thing, right? But anyway, so so when I talk to people about that, I usually say, "So what do you call it?" Because most people don't use that language. That's the jargon that you talk to your, you yeah. know, fellow travelers at the conference. Yeah, stuff. sure. You don't talk with clients about that. You figure out, you know, what right. language and what, how do I. So Talk about it in something that's familiar to them. Yes, sir. So, so the, the the best guidance I have for anyone in our field 
um, however they define that field, I define it as about a half a dozen things. But let's let's say let's just say learning and development, for example, because it, it, the same criteria applies. If you can't explain it to your mother, don't use the term. <laughs> I'm serious. That and boy, I failed that miserably over and over and over and over every time. I so finally I listened to how my mom described what her son did to her friend. She said, he teaches courses and writes books. That's it, guy. That's what I do. It's demystified. Now you know. It absolutely is. I'm wondering. And I thought, wow, why did I spend so much time learning all these other skills and developing all that expertise when really I just teach courses? The, the, apparently, I don't create any materials. I just teach it somehow magically. And well, I write books, sometimes about the same thing, interestingly enough. She didn't say that, but I know better. Hey, speaking uh -huh. of so this is one of the books. Uh, my mom, uh, she was familiar with the first version of this. It was had a blue cover. That came when out. Did that, when did when did that first that first edition come out? Nineteen ninety five. Okay. Interestingly enough, it was a commercialized version of an in house product that I did first, a small banking organization called Citicorp. Um, they wanted something, <laughs> you'll love this, on process mapping. Mm -hmm. Because the only way you could get anything on process mapping at the time was go through Gary's course on, on organization mapping. Gary really never had training on process mapping until my book, and when he started using it later on, I found out. That was, that was a big thrill for me. This is the second edition, came out in 2011. Now, the, uh, I, here's another book. Remember, I was talking, well, let's see. So remember I said I I was thinking about quality stuff early on. Yeah. Okay, this is this is called an action guide to making quality happen. What a mouthful. But it, I'm telling you it absolutely is an action guide to make quality happen in any organization. How does it do that? Cuz it's about a quality management system. That's almost as bad as human performance technology. But <laughs> Quality management system? Yes, every single organization on the planet has a quality management system. If you're a, a, a lean organization, you don't call it a quality management system. What do you call it? Ooh, that's your lean business system. They're the same thing, depending on what discipline and profession and industry and perspective you bring to bear. So I put all my smarts, <laughs> such as they were, uh, into this because I said, how in the world do you help people enter, introduce and implement and measure the effectiveness of our quality management system? Because it's so important. I said, oh, I know. Why don't we describe everything in behavioral terms? Because so I learned that, how to do that. So let me, so let me ask you here. So yeah. This is what I this is kind of what I wanted to get out uh, from our conversation here for the audience. OK, there's people in the L&D business who crank out, you know, L&D content yeah. Some are getting wise to the fact that if you were to actually look at the job, you might decide that people don't need that. They need something else or they need learning content and something else. There I'll you go. Uh -huh. just to the, so. So your movement into the quality world is, is evidenced by that book and some of the work that you were doing. Can you talk to me and our audience a little bit about, okay, so there's overlaps and gaps between TQM and HPT or whatever you want to call it. Sure, them. You know, sure. Lean Six Sigma world and yeah. the rest of the quality tools that go along with it. And, and there's the, Performance improvement uh, discipline, if you will, a la Rumler and Mager and Harless and Gilbert yeah. and hundreds, I'm hundreds of others. I'm getting something off the wall. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. There's a famous fable called The Blind Men in the Elephant. Yep. That's yep. what this picture is. Okay. The things that you just talked about, the different Six Sigma, uh, Lean, 
quality, uh, process improvement, learning and development, each of those could be thought of in the same terms as this blind man in the elephant fable. Uh -huh. I, so for people aren't familiar with that story. Uh, some blind men happen upon something that they can only feel and hear. And one of them, you know, touches the trunk and says, oh, this thing is a whatever. Another one feels the, the tail. and Oh, this thing is a whatever. And so that goes on for about four or five times. And that, in my view, and the reason I even have this photo is what I was trying to figure out, because people say, what does your business do? This is before I knew about the mom test, okay? Yeah. So, right? And so I was trying to say, you know, I said, well, God, how am I going to try to communicate HPT and all that stuff to people? I came up with this. I paid, you know, money to have this created. Um, custom drawing, so I just kept the drawing. Drawings cool. I'm gonna hang it back up in a minute after the call. Um, but the point is, how are they? Do they overlap? Sure, um, because they each are part of. Are you ready for this? A system guy. The secret sauce to all of this, I still feel, and, and, and uh, probably until I die, will be the, the principles. Associated with some with with Gary's work called organization as systems. Mm -hmm. Every organization of any size operates as a system. In my humble opinion, once you can see things that way, and I can only see things that way because it's an accident of birth in terms of how my brain works. I think. I see part whole relationships and invisible architectures at the same time. That's what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. That is an exceptionally useful skill set if you want to work in this field. It turns out that you have to kind of hide that skill set and not talk about that skill set because it'll just confuse and hurt the brains of your clients if you do. But if you have that skill set, then you can be equally comfortable in all of those disciplines that you mentioned. Yeah, because because they each okay, that it's all okay. So the tools and techniques associated, say, with TQM or Six Sigma or Lean, deal with different properties and components of a system. Mm -hmm. uh, think of a component as a resource, because uh, that's what an accountant would call it, um, and that's what Lean thinkers would call it: resource resources. And lean thinking terminology or TQM, especially TQM, resources create value or they create waste. When you consume a resource, it only ends up one of two things. It, the form of that resource, it, it gets transformed. If it's in something value, that's called value. Customers determine that, by the way. Companies don't, customers do. If not, and, and Gary would say, uh, the output from the system goes into a receiving system. Okay, so Lean calls that a value stream, and the output there is the product and service that exits the value stream. Where does it go? To a customer receiving system. If you can draw the system map that, that Gary uses, mm -hmm. put a value stream, you can put a swim lane diagram, you can put a flow chart, you can put any other graphic representation, and do the translation. You just have to think of it in systems thinking terminology. If you have those concepts and models, boom, you've got the universal translator for how to make sense out of stuff that people have been trying to do for 50 years or more or longer because yeah. they call it different things because they see only certain things. They say, for this thing, you need this thing. So if I'm looking there to address a skill of knowledge opportunity. I need something called learning and development. If I've got a quality issue, whew, I need something called quality or process improvement or continuous improvement. Oh, that comes in a lot of different flavors. If I'm dealing with variation, ooh, then I want Six Sigma. If I'm dealing with waste and reducing waste, ooh, then I want lean. But what if I'm the Air Force 
and I'm dealing with software development. Oh, then I want something called the software capability maturity model integrated. Now, I have worked in all of those domains, every single one of them. I'm, I'm, I can speak the language in every single one of those domains um, because it's just, I, it's just, it's, you know, it's a curse. It's a curse. But so let let me shift us slightly here. Yes. Our audience, if we if we assume that our audience here are basically people learn, doing learning and development stuff, okay. whatever that okay. may be, yep. and they want to expand their horizons, expand their value that they bring to the organization okay. beyond okay. knowledge and skills, where would you point people to, to people, to books? The articles that come to mind that you think should be part of their self-development to broaden their horizons. Okay, so um, I would start everybody with the three levels of quality article that I referenced from Gary mm -hmm. Brooker back in, and I think it's eighty-eight. You can get the actual article. Uh, you, you can still get that. Um, uh, I'd really recommend though the improving the white space. Uh, excuse me, improving performance, managing the white space in the organization chart, second edition, not the third, second edition, first or second edition, because Gary and Alan did the first and second edition. Then they sold all that stuff. The people that bought it wrote the third edition. Who knows what's in that? Okay. And so don't wait. Don't, I mean, <clears throat> I wouldn't invest in that. But I would invest in the first or second editions. Right. Then you get everything that was in the article, and you get all that neat stuff um, from Tom Gilbert, and you get a lot of neat stuff from uh, understanding quality, and you get a lot of neat stuff on continuous improvement. Only it would be called performance improvement. Boy, you I'm get sorry, where you said you get all that great stuff? Yeah, not from the. Two Rumler books. I mean, is yeah, you would have done from the two Rumler books. All right, so it's been a while since I've read the uh, Improving Performance book, uh, the night the nineteen ninety version, the first time. right, right. Um, and um, so when I say stuff, you're not going to get TQM. You're not going to get Six Sigma. Yeah, his language is not systems. As same as yeah, it's, it's it's all system thinking and all systems. That's what you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah, that, you're going to see that, and so I think that that's a good place to go. What if I needed to learn a little bit more about those people doing the quality stuff here in case we collaborate on an effort here and I need to know their lingo? Okay. Where, where, right. where do I start to really broaden out from training or instruction or learning into performance improvement from that world, the HR world, the, the programmed instruction world, because that's where they all came from? Yeah. You know? Evolve from there. Yeah. How do I how do I get more attuned to the the TQM world and uh, uh, you know what's happening over in that world? So that I I don't want to become necessarily a black belt practitioner, but I want to be a green belt. Not you know have some knowledge. Okay, so so from a from a one stop shopping professional association point of view, you go to ASQ. Okay. Um, I, that's what you do. They're the big, big. That's what that's what traditionally you would do. Now, since you and I are good friends, and presumably some of uh, uh, our listeners, we'd want to give them some helpful tips. Hey, I'll tell you. Look, just go straight to Lean Enterprise Institute. L e a n dot o r g. It's the exemplar now for. Um, I would consider uh, professional associations in general, but their focus, it's a bunch of ex, ex for, uh, former Toyota people. When I say Toyota people, I mean people that worked for Toyota like a decade or more. Yeah. So I'm in Japan, but the point is, what does that mean? It means they've learned to think a certain way about approaching improvements in organizations, and they understand the importance of Developing people. There's no organization in my mind that does more to develop people than Toyota. People mm -hmm. think they build cars. Yeah. yeah. No, their people build cars. Toyota's in the people development business. 
Mm-hmm. And they just happen to make co- vehicles. Mobility, actually, they call it. So yeah. is this lean.org? Is, are these people that are, you know, pra- practicing? Yes, some, yes, some, yes. Some yes. Production strangely, system? Enough, strangely enough, it, it is set up as a nonprofit organization. But I'm going to tell you, they're very expensive. So uh, I think what they do, everything they do, their books, their training, everything is very expensive. It's very expensive. Um, I think they reinvest all of that money into their online um, platform capabilities and attracting even better people. Mm-hmm. They have, they have. When I first encountered that organization, it was a shadow of what it has become. Mm-hmm. I almost uh, uh, had written it off. It, 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 it had been started by oh boy, academicians. I have to be careful how I say this. People that uh, the guy that wrote uh, The Machine That Changed the World, James Womack, mm-hmm. did more to popularize lean thinking than anybody else on the planet, to popularize it. He didn't discover it. One of his graduate students did. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the work that the benchmarking work that the, that was incorporated into a book called The Machine That Changed the World, that would be a good publication for people to read. Yeah. Just because you'd see the business case for this thing called lean thinking. You would see the business case. You would go, how can that be? How can it, how can a how can one industry use one set of methods and techniques and principles and practices and and be 10 times more efficient and effective as another. How indeed, no one's figured it out, apparently. Well, Not I, in the US, they don't seem to that, be. That, that's, that, that's a great book. I haven't read that book in a long, long time. In fact, that's where I got the uh, the idea to name um, my one of my books, Lean ISD, was from the, the script. It's, it's a wonderful book. Lean. It's, it's a yeah, wonderful it's a good. Book. I think that's a good book. So, so what I've gotten from you is the Rumler article, the three levels of quality. Yep. Improving performance book, first or second edition. Yep. The machine that changed the world. Yeah. To me, that sounds like that's a good uh, to uh, ornerist uh, to uh, yep. aim at those kinds of resources to help them begin to figure out. How do I begin to think about uh, improving performance differently than just the uh, yeah. from the learning and development perspective? Yeah, this, this book is the book um, that I would highly. Okay, so so how do I say this? Rumler is to Gary Rumler is to systems thinking and organization is systems thinking. This is one of those analogy kind of things, right? As Taichi Ono is to the Toyota production system. Mm-hmm. Ichi Ono was the architect of the Toyota production system. Over his 50 years, he describes in this little book, this book came out in 1988. What a banner year 1988 turned out to be. Same year Rummer published his article. Same year I started my business. That That's going to be a minor footnote in history. Mm-hmm. Same year the English, the first English translation of any of Ono's work appeared in the United States. What a year 1988 was. So if you read this book, and it is written in English, you don't have to, you know, translate the Japanese, which is, which it was only in Japanese 10 years prior to this. Mm -hmm. Um, And it, it was just the generosity of the people of Toyota that said, sure, we'll, 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 we'll put it all in a book and you still won't be able to figure it out. (laughs) <laughs> and they did, and nobody has. And I highlighted a couple things. Ono himself says right at the very beginning, I love this. Um, let's see if I can find this for you. Well, I should have flagged this because you know a prepared person would have. Here it is. The Toyota production system, however, is not just a production system. I am confident it will reveal its strengths as a management system adapted to today's era of global markets and high level computerized information systems. He said that in 1987. 
a management system. Oh my gosh, who else uses those phrases? <laughs> Gary Runkler, a management system. Oh my gosh, in the same years that you, the exact same year, guy, that use those words. Who would know that? Well, I did, because I read the stuff. Now our audience can read the same things and form their own conclusions. Yes, thank you, Robert. And, and this I wanted to get to that. And so let me let me bring our interview to a, a close here by asking um, for your thoughts, your guidance to new people in L and D, based on all of your experiences here in 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 broadening your horizons and serving your customers beyond giving them off the shelf content or custom content. What's your guidance for them? What 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 would you suggest to people coming right out of college and getting into the job for the first time? What what do you think that they should be paying attention to, and what should they do? Okay, so I asked. So I'm gonna. So I'll give you my guidance, and I give the guidance that to answer the question that I got and formulated from Joe Harless. He said, "Always work from a model of performance." And a corollary to that was avoid superstitious behavior. Now, he also said it doesn't have to be my model, meaning the harness model. It doesn't have to be the front end analysis for soft skills training model. And I said, that's good, Joe, because I can use, I like Gary Monlich. <laughs> anyway, so my advice is work from a model. The model I would suggest is something called systems thinking. I would suggest the model as it's articulated um, by Gary through a set of principles in his Improving Performance book, that's the single most powerful model. It's touched upon in the three levels article. Um, there are multiple models in there, but that's where I would start. If they start there, whatever path they take later on, we'll just build, they can just lay it on top of the systems model. If they can, if they, if they can grok the systems model, like your shirt says, they'll be able to grok any other thing that they come into, including information technology, actual, actual real technology that deals with information. Um, because then they'll realize, oh, so that's how it fits in. It's one of those interdependent components within a system. And there are things we want to pay attention to about that. And really, gosh, the way Toyota approaches that is, they take the waste out of the system first before they automate it in any way, shape, or form with information technology. What a novel concept. Hmm. That way you don't pay billions for ERP systems to pave over cow paths. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's a thing, actually. actually I, I, yeah, it is. That's that's one. So that's the advice I'd say. Systems model. Ago. Systems model. Do that. Um, I'd say make friends with people in the continuous improvement function because they need someone that can help them create effective learning materials. No one will ever be successful in continuous improvement field without effective learning materials. You have to develop people. How do you develop people? Well, through practice and feedback and learning materials. Someone's got to help those folks. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we're running, going to run short on time here. So let me thank you, and uh, we'll get together and uh, maybe talk about this a little bit some more in the future. Good, and I'd like I'd like to be able to grok it when we do. I hope so. I, I'm going to grok this as well. You okay. take care. Cheers. Thank you. Appreciate that.